Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value and The Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today, Dan interviews Kevin Duffy, co-founder of Bearing Asset Management. And today we'll talk about bank failures. Lots of fun. And remember, you can send us your feedback at feedback at investorhour.com and tell us what's on your mind. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So, Corey, anything more fun than a good old-fashioned bank failure? I don't, really, I don't know if there is. Ooh, wee. yeah, this what a <laughs> what a time. Uh, uh, I know. Bank, and, oh, good old fashioned community bank run in Silicon Valley. I mean, who who can make it up? Yeah, I know. In Silicon Valley, of all places, all that money, all those billionaires, and that's where we get the bank run. Well, Great. you know, it, it makes sense in a way. Everybody's you know sitting in front of their computers or on their phones, you know, seeing all this news about. Uh, you know, this bank isn't solvent, which it hadn't been for several months, but all of a sudden it becomes a thing and, <laughs> and, uh, a bank run happens and you know, everybody thinks they're so smart today, but the same things happen yeah. over and over for hundreds of years or, you know, however long you, you want to say the first, ba- whenever the first bank run happens. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's. I hate to say we like expected some of these things, but you know, this is what <laughs> a fed heightening t- tightening cycle has led to this climb. Right. You're never sure what's going to break first, but you know, something's going to break and it's obviously these banks and people are finding out, you know, like you could do this to any bank in the country. Right. I, I, I really, that's what scares me here is that, no bank has all the deposits available, like none. <laughs> yeah, you know? and I you, that's, you that, and that's what's there. happening. That's why it's you know that's why the the <laughs> contagion threat is so quick. You know, it's yeah. like oh wait, people realize what's actually happening here, right? And this word confidence gets thrown around like. President Biden, he had to use the word confidence. He had to say, you know, whatever it was he said on Tuesday morning, (laughs) have confidence. America's banking system is safe. I was like, oh, my God, he said it out loud. (laughs) It's the same thing the Silicon Valley Bank CEO said, you know, on the day of when everybody was getting worried. It's stay calm, which reminded me of the same thing the Chinese government said at the beginning of COVID, which was you Americans over there don't panic. (laughs) <laughs> yeah don't panic uh oh like, okay well <laughs> i'll see how that all that turned out yes me thinks the lady doth protest too much yeah um anyway i didn't mean to get too far off topic but it was well yeah it's it, true. like you were saying it's just uh we don't know where these weaknesses were going to to come but you know here they are so yeah they have arrived um and the I don't want to talk about what the Fed's going to do next because we beat we beat the Fed horse to death last week. But it's interesting to contemplate like exactly how all this happened. Just if there's a troubling, you know, potentially systemic problem here, the piece that really bothers me the most is that Silicon Valley Bank's horrible run started on March 8th when they announced a couple of things they announced that they had sold all their available for sale securities, basically all their bonds, all their bonds and mortgage-backed securities at a $1.8 billion loss. And that then they said, well, we're going to raise a billion eight-ish you know, in debt and equity or whatever. And then that announcement set off a $42 billion bank run. And I'm like, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but every bank in the country is holding this stuff. Like everybody's holding mortgage-backed securities and treasury bonds, right? Which we know got whacked. You know, the treasuries were down 30% in 2022. And if you just look at um, the mortgage-backed security uh, ETF, MBB, down 20-ish percent from its all-time high, down about 17% last year. I mean, those are big moves for what are supposed to be like two of the absolute safest asset classes in the world. 
And all banks are holding them, right? So, like, who else is having a problem here? It's 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 worrisome. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, it is, and that's what people, you know, it's you mentioned confidence. It's well, if this could happen there, why why can't it happen where you know in the bank I'm in? And yeah. it's a very valid question. <laughs> it's a, uh, um, it's. It really is. I mean, everything's a confidence game, really. Somebody told me that a long time ago. Like, you know, the yeah. markets are all, are all a big confidence game, um, but at least yeah. at least partially. But it's sure it's uh, yeah. I, they're, <clears throat> they're, Silicon Valley Bank is not the only bank that has, it did what it did and basically did some balance sheet stuff where these securities ended up being kind of not hidden on the balance sheet, but hard to find. That they were sitting on these billions of losses, you know. Some people, some analysts that followed it, figured it out like you know relatively quickly. But it's actually they were sitting on it's like sixteen billion in losses overall in these securities that you're talking about. And they just the news they put out like, oh, you know, we can get past that. We we got plenty of money on hand. Which honestly, if the bank run didn't happen, they probably you <laughs> they would probably be okay. In the in the long run, just because they would still, you know, they'd be running their business and and figure out a way to keep it going. But because of the bank run happened, uh, they're not. Uh, which which, you know, in a way, uh, it, this whole situation is you know it scares a lot of people. But in a way, it it shows you the power that real people still have <laughs> in this world. Um, you know, you, you hate to, for it to be. You have to show a, a bank run for it to happen. But like, let's not. Th- these institutions are not, you know, infallible. Are not, uh, you know, they're not. They're, they're not going <laughs> to. They don't have to be there forever. Uh, you know, and and oh. it's it just reminds you about. Um, I don't know. To me, like the humanity part of of uh, of the markets, um, which yeah is just. A lot of yeah. times goes overlooked, you know, when people are t- like the professionals are talking about the numbers and earnings and and whatnot. But sure, when it comes right. down they're to it, modeling, what, yeah, what's everything there for? You know, so right, they're modeling all this stuff like it's a machine, like it's a you know a contained system, like an engine or a machine or a washing machine or something. They know all the parts. They know how it all works. They know how fast it goes and where it's likely to break and all that stuff and how to fix it and all that. But it's not a machine. It's like, I keep saying humans are in markets the way fish are in water. You know, markets, we didn't create markets. They just happened to us when we just allowed ourselves to to get along with one another. You know, when we stopped beating each other over the head with rocks and, you know, when we stop embargoing and declaring war and all that horrible stuff that doesn't work, we just leave each other alone. Trade happens, markets happen, and they happen to us the same way. I think that you know, water and wind and tides and waves and stuff happen to fish. So we don't have control. The Fed doesn't have control. The bank sure as hell don't have control over anything, right. you know. And uh, and you know that loss you just talked about. <clears throat> That like that wiped out their equity, 15, 16 billion hours. I mean, and this can happen anywhere in the country, you know? And, uh, and the thing is like a 10 X levered bank is like conservative, <laughs> you know, that's the conservative one. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's, it, it is amazing that we don't get a lot more bank failures and that people do have the confidence that they do. I have to say it's, it's a modern miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, unfortunately, I think you're right. It's, uh, you know, maybe, and then maybe this won't be the last one, uh, of the next couple months or something, or maybe it will, you know, I, I also yeah. like it, liken this to what happened. Uh, what was it? Six months ago in the, in the UK with the, remember the gilts, the bonds sure. over there, that, that pension oh, yeah. crisis. It was this simil- <clears throat> a, similar and different in that it was yeah. tied to the the Fed starting rate hiking, which messed with the value of the the euro and, and the and the the bonds over in Europe, and that took down the value of the bonds there, which were <laughs> tied to these leveraged pension funds, and then the yeah. 
central bank there had stepped in and did a like a you know a mini rescue right and around the same time right similar event in japan bigger event in japan you know 40 plus billion dollar event they had to intervene to save the freaking currency right so essentially yeah. the same thing is happening here yep. it's more of an effect of the the lag of the u.s interest rates like you know these decisions made by silicon valley bank were 18 months ago that ultimately you know caught up to them now uh, because this was you know they they bought these long-term treasuries and mortgage backed securities before the rate hike cycle at you know and the, the, when the rates went up they, they turned to losses so um my point is it's maybe more of this happens but maybe not too uh either way the feds already stepped in and intervened again which you know i saw a couple nights ago the the fed balance sheet right the, the chart of the fed balance sheet and the trimming that had been happening since you know over the past half a year or so and what they did with this bank loan i forgot the acronym whatever they called it um to to prop up these banks cut out half the the balance sheet reduction and all of the balance sheet reduction that happened in the past four months i think it was so mm -hmm. you know it's and then you you have the then you have to listen to the Fed say oh but we care about inflation and we're trimming the balance sheet as part of that and we're raising interest right. rates as part of that but oh wait when something happens with uh, Silicon Valley Bank and a couple others you know we can we can deal with you know a little higher inflation essentially is what they're saying they're not ever going to say exactly. that but there this is the end game for it is we will intervene and at the expense of something <laughs> and that something is probably going to be more inflation exactly more infl yeah this is the epic battle i wrote about this in the ferris report i forget what issue there's only a few of them because it's a brand new publication so maybe second or third issue but it was i was writing about the thing called the milkshake theory we talked with brent johnson about that and it's an epic battle it's banks and bond markets on one side of the battlefield and currencies on the other right? So you're either saving the banks or you're saving the currency. And ultimately, as you're pointing out, uh, the currency always has to kind of give up a little bit so we can save the banks and bond markets. And that's what happened in the guilt crisis. That's what happened in, you know, that Japan crisis at around the same time, but last September. Same thing. You're right. It's all the same. It's a battle between the currency on one side and the banks and bonds on the other. And they always choose to save the banks and bonds. Right. And the, the, the currency loses. Yeah. Yeah. And an yeah. important difference this time is, you know, for the last how many years interest rates were going down and, and were near zero. But now they're in a trend, you know, that we're making new uh, or above the previous cycle highs already. So we're in this <laughs> environment, I think, where, where rates are ultimately keep going higher and in the past the, the central banks could cut in, come in and cut rates not worry about inflation going higher now mm -hmm. if they cut rates inflation is still above their hypothetical two percent goal so yeah. you have to cutting rate they can't it's not as simple as just cutting rates and saying oh we're coming to the rescue like because of higher inflation right so it, it is different. I hate to say that, but it's different we're, this we're, time. <laughs> we're talking about flip, you know, when you talk about flipping the markets on their head the last 20 years or, you know, 40 years, whatever you want to do it, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the big consequences. Like the central banks, they can only probably make things worse at this point. I don't, I don't know what, what they're going to do. I hate to laugh during that, but that's, it, this isn't like 08 where they could step in and just lower rates and flood, you know, uh, they can lower rates, but there's going to be an expense here. It's going to be, you know, more persistent inflation, I think. Right. The problem here is like these forces are epic and they're, they're so big that you really, you almost can't stand back far enough to figure out what to do about them. Like, you know, I wasn't short Silicon Valley Bank. I wasn't short Silvergate or I wanted to be short Silvergate a while ago, but I just, I don't like shorting in general because it's really difficult. Um, and I think there's still a lot of speculative juice out in the market, remarkably. And so 
oh, what do you do? It's hard. It's hard. That's this is yeah. like I, I almost I think you know my basic prescription of prepare, don't predict, and then you know hold plenty of cash, hold gold, buy good cash flowing businesses, don't overpay. All that stuff I've been saying a million times. It probably sounds like I'm throwing my hands up, but I honestly believe it's prudent. But you know there is a certain there is a lot of uncertainty and and a lot of risk to think about. You know, so it's just, it's a rough time. It, it, it is a rough time. We talked with Colin Roach. Do you remember we talked with Colin Roach and he was talking about the slow grind? I think the slow grind is here. The grinding has begun. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. And it's, yeah, I hate to sound like, you know, too doom and gloomy, uh, you know, because you kind of mm-hmm. have to <laughs> live your life and, and, move ahead and and if anything you know i think from a stock bond you know investment perspective if this causes the fed to pause the rate hikes um you know at the the next meeting or say they're going to pause them you know or something like that i mean stocks are going to like that um so i i think um or the opposite could happen (laughs) and they're like, oh no, this means something's wrong, and uh, because I keep thinking, also, I, I'm like contradicting myself as I speak here, but I keep thinking about how the every bear market since 1955 hasn't ended until the Fed starts cutting rates, and they haven't paused yet. I mean, they might, they might be this month, might be next month, and then, okay, could stocks you know, enjoy a, a nice little run again. Sure. And th- then we're into <laughs> the real lag effects of the interest rates and the recession. If you think a recession is right. coming, then they cut rates. And like what we were talking, like I was talking about earlier, either is inflation still a huge problem at that point or not? That will play into that. Yes, it is. It is. And yeah. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because that recession doesn't solve and the the rate cutting and the recession and whatever ensues there does not solve the supply issue right, right. Yeah. we're com- we're still coming out of a pandemic we still have supply chain issues and that's why the fed is like trying to crush demand with rate hikes right they're just trying to crush demand they're not doing anything about supply they're not doing anything to encourage the production of additional goods and services to meet this growing demand, right? So (laughs) what happens if we get a recession? Does that incentivize anybody to do that? No, it doesn't. So we come out of that and this happened like the 70s inflationary decade was split in half by a recession. Same thing. I think that paradigm is, you know, this is not the 70s, but that part of it, that works for me. That makes total sense. Yeah. And, and, and to continue the thought there on if we're going to see a Fed pause or, or you know, mm. now I think, you know, generally speaking, that would be good for bond prices because yields are probably, you know, going to come down and, mm-hmm. and gold too, I think. I think a lot of stuff's lining up for gold. I think that would be welcome news to a lot of people. Uh, you right. know, if we're talking about higher than expected inflation and slowing down of, you know, the economy, um, to me, gold yeah. makes a lot of sense for, for a lot of different reasons. So gold's less than 50 bucks from $2,000 as we speak. Oh, all right. Yeah. I know it's been up I 6% mean, since all this banking stuff started. So yeah, I think if you're been waiting around for gold, I think, to take off, I, I I think all of this all this chaos is actually uh, good news for that. But yeah, which is why you want to own it in the first place, right? It just reminds me of uh, Charlie Munger. <laughs> Every time he talks about gold, he said you'd have to be insane to want gold prices to go up <laughs> because when they go up, everything else is going <laughs> to hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. So I have to point out, I I hate to do this because I'm not a technical analyst. But starting maybe um, February of, of this year, a little over a month ago, but like early February, late, late January, um, there's this formation in gold that we call a cup and handle. I'm not a technical analyst, but I know people who have traded this formation successfully, um, repeatedly. 
And so right now we're forming like a full cup and then you get this little handle that corrects on the other side of it. So maybe gold retreats back down to around 1900 or so. And then that's your moment. That's your, you know, that's your, if it's going to, if it's going to fly, that's the moment to get in. Um, and even now, if you can tolerate what, you know, 50 bucks when, when we're at 1950, three or four, right at this moment, you know, what's 50 bucks, who cares? You can start buying now, but this moment is lining up and the action and the action, like really since, um, you know, November has been pretty great. You know, gold bottomed in September around 1600 or so, uh, just looking at a Bloomberg chart here and, and now we're at 1950. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. that's a pretty decent move. So yeah, I'm ready to buy me some more gold, man. I've actually, I've been doing it the last couple yeah. months, the last couple of months <laughs> I've been, uh, kind of dollar cost averaging in and I was mm -hmm. very pleased this week when. When I, when I saw the it's results crazy. of that, that's, that's why you do that. You know, it's, uh, yeah, you don't know the it's exact like, timing of these things, but if you spread it out enough, right. you, you can enjoy the benefits. It, so it's Charlie's right. It's crazy. It's like, I was so pleased when the banks failed and my gold went up, you know, <laughs> but that's the way it is. You're pleased to have gold. You're not pleased that other people are suffering. Correct. However, there is a bit of schadenfreude. I must admit you know, when people do crazy things with cheap money, I mean, that's the ultimate problem. Well, fractional reserve banking plus cheap money. What a horrible combination. And we, we, we knew we knew everybody who was like long, all this crazy, garbagey, cash burning tech stuff, which Silicon Valley Bank essentially was by taking their both their loans and their deposits, you know. It wasn't going to turn out for good for anybody who was long this garbage, you know. Arc Innovations down seventy five percent. I mean, come on, this it was all it was all predetermined as soon as they were all in at the top. Correct. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. There's certain people you feel for. Uh, there's other people you don't. <laughs> like yeah. I would say, the the yeah. CEO of the bank of Silicon Valley Bank, who was on the San Francisco Fed regional board. I mean, yeah. What are we talking about here? Like this is just right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. The I guys, could go on for a long time about all the the exactly. conflicts of interest and and all of that stuff. It's just uh -huh. and then who gets bailed out, you know, and who doesn't? It's um, that's a whole nother debate and a whole nother talk. That is a whole nother thing. But just the sheer level of incompetence, like. If bank management teams don't know how to handle a hot rising interest rate environment, who does, you know? I mean, this is literally their job was to navigate this environment. And they're, you know, you had one job, right? <laughs> and they completely botched it up. They did the exact yeah. wrong thing at the exact wrong time. Yeah, higher rates should be good for banks because they're yes. they're able to make they're able to uh, yeah, they're able to make more on in the shorter run. It's so I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm not a banker. Never wanted to yeah, be. Me neither. But you know, here I am <laughs> talking about banks, bank failures. All right, let's let's talk with our guest about banks and bank failures. And uh, I know he's quite a critic of the banking system, so I can't wait to see what he tells us. His name is Kevin Duffy. He's a friend of mine. We've had him on the show a couple of times. And let's do it. Let's talk with Kevin Duffy right now. If you're holding out hope for a bull market, then please pay close attention. According to legendary investor Mark Chaikin, who Jim Cramer famously said he'd never bet against, you need to prepare for the next wave of volatility to hit U.S. stocks. Mark's prediction is based on an indicator that has only triggered a handful of times in the last 72 years with a 100% success rate for predicting where stocks will go next. Now, the man who's just spotted it is sounding the alarm. During Mark's 50-year career, he's worked alongside some of the biggest investors in history, including Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Steinhardt. In fact, Mark invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators for picking stocks, still used by hedge funds, banks, and brokerage sites, and today found in every Bloomberg terminal on the planet. Now, 
Mark's inviting you to join him as he explains exactly what the next wave of volatility will look like and where it will send stocks in the coming weeks. He's even sharing one of his favorite ideas free for those who tune in. He says this idea could create bigger gains than anything he's used his power gauge system for until now by turning the coming market volatility to your advantage. And you don't have to wait until March 28th to get started. For a sneak peek of Mark's big reveal, go to chaikinevent23.com. That's C-H-A-I-K-I-N event23.com. All right, it's time for our interview once again. Today's guest is uh, my friend and previous podcast guest, Kevin Duffy. Uh, You can find him on Twitter, Kevin Duffy1929. And he's the author of a really good newsletter to which I do subscribe called The Coffee Can Portfolio. And uh, Kevin, thanks for coming back to talk with us again. Dan, thanks for having me back on. So let's, you know, let's not. Let's not beat around the bush here. Um, folks have gotten to know you so uh, in two previous episodes, so um, they can listen to those if they want some background. But we got to dive into this SVB thing, Silicon Valley Bank, um, because it's serious business. I know what I think about it, but I want to know what you think are the are the key takeaways from this. Well. Wow. You know, you almost you don't know where to where to begin with this, um, right? But uh, you know, let's. Uh, I actually put together some some statistics on the uh, uh, the growth of of bank assets uh, mm-hmm. leading up to the uh, the COVID uh, response, the the mm-hmm. big the massive stimulus, and so um, you had from from the end of 2014 to the end of 2019 um, bank assets uh, commercial bank assets were up 34 uh, percent then the the Fed came in and sprayed money everywhere the Fed's balance sheet now during that time the Fed's balance sheet had actually grown about four percent okay which is a little surprising to me that bank assets uh, grew faster than the Fed's balance sheet but anyway the Fed's balance sheet grew by 112 percent. Um, in the two years from the end of, of 2019 to the end of, of 2021, and mm-hmm. commercial bank assets, uh, commercial bank deposits went up 82 percent. Okay, over that time, so in the previous period, of course, we have this boom in, in Silicon Valley, and and Silicon Valley banks' assets grew up to COVID 82 percent over that time, so well above normal. During the um, the two years of the COVID stimulus, they tripled. So um, you had this just massive boom in, in assets. Right. So that's that's part of it. Um, you you have this this uh, you know. So the bank is basically making loans to uh, private equity to venture capital. So they they have you know a risky loan book. Um, what they're doing is basically uh, balancing that with Treasury securities, treasury securities, and um, in their case, more importantly, residential mortgage-backed securities. And so, yeah. as long as these were backed, um, as long as as these securities were either government securities or they were backed by government guarantees in the Basel th- uh, Basel three um, requirements in terms of how they calculate uh, capital, um, they they're in their risk weighted assets, they got a zero weighting. Okay. So they were doing everything according to the book to balance this risky loan book with, you know, less risky assets. I think the bottom line is that those assets that a a bond, you could have triple, a triple A credit could be rock solid. I mean, we could have a debate about whether the government is, is a triple A credit or not, but, uh, Mm -hmm. The problem is that a bond, if the yield goes to zero or or it gets very low, then all of a sudden you have a you have a price risk. Okay, and this was not in anybody's models. This was this was not on the radar screen. And so, um, you know, when the bond bubble burst in 2022, of course, the uh, the part of the boat that was supposed to be ballast now sprung a, a, a leak. Okay, making things even worse, those uh, a lot of those uh, securities were marked held to held to maturity. So 
they were kept off the bank's balance sheets in terms of um, of these risk parameters, these these capital ratios. And uh, so, really, the problem the problem showed up in the middle of 2022. But you know, we're just now getting around to to recognizing it. Right. So 2022. Um, my take on this is that cheap money killed Silicon Valley Bank because. You know, they loaded up on treasuries and MBS, mortgage-backed securities, right at, you know, fairly near the top, right? The real top was in 2020, but, you know, they really loaded up um, throughout that period, actually. Like you say, it's a two-year period, end of 2019 to the end of 2021, assets tripled, deposits tripled, and, you know, I think per share earnings were up like, you know, 20 from 21 to 33 per share. It was it was a huge boom. I mean, uh, all the metrics just went off the charts, and they were geniuses, right? But then, then cheap money got them. And my view is like, the cheap money had them as soon as they took it on, as soon as they succumbed to it and tripled all, all these assets under you know zero percent interest rates. They were doomed one way or another. Maybe not doomed to fail, but doomed to have a really bad time. And when did they fail? Well, they failed when they sold all their available for sale securities, all the cheap money, and lost a billion eight. Oops. Oh, and then they announced they had to raise a billion eight. Oops. And then the run happened. They lost forty two billion in deposits in a week. <laughs> you know, cheap money killed them. In my in my opinion. Yeah, and you know, I think that was part of what killed them. But I think the bigger source of the problem here is fractional reserve banking itself. Oh. That that to me is the root of the problem, and the root absolutely of the problem correct. Here, yeah, and the root of the problem here is is leverage. And you know, I started thinking about this as a hedge fund. It, you, you could think about a bank as a as a hedge fund, and you could think about okay, you you want to invest in a hedge fund. What what are the qualities that you're looking for in a in a good hedge fund? Uh, and I, I started, you know, so I I wrote these down. Well, one is you want you want contrarians. You want people that kind of think independently, out of the box. You want them to be unconstrained, um, to be able to go where the best opportunities are, um, independent of government narratives and, and independent thinkers. You don't want leverage. You don't want a whole lot of leverage in a hedge fund. And in fact, if anything, you'd like the hedge fund to maybe even hedge. Um, you want patient capital. You want investors this is the this is the secret of Seth Klarman, uh, patient capital. Um, you want conservative pricing. You want um, t- tight risk controls, and you'd really like to have skin in the game. You'd like the the people running the money to have skin in the game. Okay, that's that's kind of the ideal hedge fund. Now let's invert that. All right, and I think if we invert that, what we see is is a is a classic fractional res- you know modern day fractional reserve bank. What we have is instead of contrarians, we have conformists. We have people that are um, uh, very much constrained by by politics, by by regulation. Um, they're very they become uh, very dependent on the government, um, and even more so with the great financial crisis uh, in, in two thousand eight. Yep, pure status quo pursuers, pure pro cyclical status quo. Yep, uh, absolutely. And so as a result. Uh, these nonconformist status quo seekers tend to, they have a knack for ending up piling into the bubble assets, you know, at, at the time. Um, you know, you also have, they're highly leveraged. So you look at something like, um, like Silicon Valley Bank, their, their total assets to, uh, to shareholder equity. Now, this is the, the false shareholder equity. Forget about the unrealized losses. But uh, it was 13 and a half times. Now you say, okay, JP Morgan is a fortress balance sheet. Well, it's 15 times, you know, so you're, you're talking, you know, a good bank might be 10 times highly leveraged. Um, and maybe some of these banks are hedged, but it, apparently in the case of Silicon Valley bank, it wasn't, um, you, you know, you have, uh, very subjective, uh, pricing of these illiquid assets. Okay. That's a, that's a problem. You have, um, you know, these these loose risk controls where you're not marking to market the securities, even the ones that are liquid, okay. Mm-hmm. And then what you really have, instead of having patient patient capital, you have fickle capital. So um, you have cap, you have these demand deposits, mm-hmm. and these people can just 
you know, if they catch wind of, of all of the leverage in the system in, at the bank, they pull their assets. Um, and then, of course, you have you have basically little skin in the game. So you have you have banks that are playing with other people's money, and it's a you know heads they win and tails they get bailed out, and the, the losses are are socialized. Yeah, losses are socialized. You know, and that of course the socialization of losses, of course, is a function of the other thing that's wrong with the banking system, which is the fed- the existence of the Federal Reserve, right? We had a, a, right. a, a dozen events in the 19th century, early 20th century, um, in the banking world where, you know, several banks went under and then the world went on its merry way. And then the Fed comes in and systematizes risk and spreads it through the entire system, basically the typhoid Mary of banking in U.S. history. And then we get the Great Depression. And yeah, so, you know, and the thing about the the Fed is, I mean, if you if you go back to fractional reserve banking and you think about this, you know, I think of it as a, as just a hedge fund, and mm-hmm. you know, I have no problem with people. Hey, you want to run a hedge fund? That's fine. But I think that what would happen in a in a free market is that that system would would collapse. Okay, yeah. so the problem is it cannot exist without some kind of support, and that support is whether it be deposit insurance or whether yep. it be whether it be the, the, the central bank. But the central right. bank has to be there in order to keep this whole thing afloat. That right. is the problem. You have to have a lender of last resort and you have yeah. to have deposit insurance and all the rest of it. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And the, so the problem is that every time we get a, a crisis, the government comes in, you know, supports the whole system, what does it have to do? It has to expand their balance sheet, print money, okay? Yeah. And and then they design, and this is what happened after the the, tw- the 2008 crisis, is they, they come up with a, 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 a design basically to fight the last war. We're going to prevent the last bubble. And the problem is that, um, that, you know, these people are fighting the last war. So they are basically designing a system that's going to prevent the previous bubble. But what they're not doing is they're essentially they're laying the groundwork for the next bubble and they're not anticipating that. And and then, you know, life finds a way water runs downhill. It finds the cracks in the system and that's what's going on right now. And this is all, this is all playing out. It's insidious and uh, it just goes on and on and on. Like we never, like there's never, um, there's never a learning moment at the level of the Federal Reserve or banking regulators or government or anything. It's just endless narrative seizing and narrative exploiting. It, nobody ever says, you know what? Ba- and then basically repeats what you just said. Nobody ever says that. <laughs> Only people like you say it. <laughs> well, you know, what's, what's frustrating about this is that this, the solution to all this is very simple. Um, the solution is that you have you should really have warehousing, and if people if people want to have their their you know the rainy day fund, their 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 uh, meet, meeting payroll, you know all these functions where you don't want to put any money at risk at all. That money should be warehoused, and so if Vanguard can run an index fund at three or four basis points, why can't a bank uh, run a warehouse for for cash that would charge very little? Okay, and have that totally separate from loan banking, which is just it would be just another investment that people would make. You know, we want to invest in in mortgages. We want to invest in home loans or commercial loans or whatever. And, you know, these deposits, they would would, would be investments. They would be they would be gated. They would be an illiquid investments. People would understand that, um, you know, your money is at risk. You're going to be compensated for that. Um, and you know, I think it would, it would solve, of course, with such a system, you wouldn't need a central bank. So you would not have all the problems that, that come with the central bank. Right. And how would people behave, Kevin, if they knew that there was no lender of last resort and no deposit insurance? Would they behave differently? I think they probably would. If they have, <laughs> they're constantly be told this story that, you'll be taken care of. The deposits are insured. 
There's a lender of last resort. The system can't go down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we saved it once and we'll save it again. It's, it's too big to fail and we can print what we need to print. If there was none of that, I think we, our culture would be different. Our whole culture would be different. Uh, absolutely. It would be very different. And, cha- you know, behavior would change on, on both sides. People would know that they're taking risk. They would want to participate in that, you know, participate in the rewards. It, mm-hmm. would, it would raise a, a higher bar on investments. There would be a real cost of capital. Um, right. And so that, that capital would be allocated differently. And what it would mean is that, you know, you, I looked at J.P. Morgan, okay, and, and you know, just to get a, a sense for the amount of, of leverage, um, if you if you look at their their uh, their leverage, it's like I said, fifteen to one. Their return on assets is one percent, or last year was one percent. Okay, if you compare that to Walmart, Walmart is levered five to one. Okay, their return on assets was five percent. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're basically we're funneling money into allocators of capital that are not very good at it. Okay, we're not the money is not finding its way into the best allocators of capital. I think if we if we had really a free market system in in money and banking and investing that you would have a much better allocation of resources. Um, and you know, I think that this whole model, this whole banking model would, would basically, uh, it wouldn't disappear, but it would be forced to compete with, with other models. And I think you would just have a much greater, much better allocation of resources. Then of course you would take away all the problems with supporting the system with central banking, uh, which is the inflation, the, de- the, you know, the devaluation of our currency, the constant boom and bust cycles that we get with it. Sign me up. I mean, it sounds good to me. Um, I'm just uh, a little bit, it's, I think it's frustrating to people like you and I, because I, we're of one mind on this issue. And, and yet the, the learning that seems to be happening in, in the halls of power where these things can be influenced and put into practice seems to be in the opposite direction. They seem to be saying, well, that worked out great for me because I didn't have, you know, I wasn't at risk. It was all the depositors and everybody else. And I got bailed out and I still got a bonus. And, you know, um, the learning seems to be going in the wrong direction. Well, I, it's very the frustrating. Problem with, the problem with the system is that, you know, it, there is, as with all of these schemes, there's a, there are winners and losers. And the the people that benefit yes. are are in the government. And, you know, the government, it, this, there's a very symbiotic relationship between the, the banking system and, and the government. And what's happened over time, there's, it's always been like this, but over time, as you've had one crisis and the next crisis is bigger than the previous crisis, and what happens is that the government is basically taking over the borrowing function. So what you're seeing right. is, a, is a crowding out the private sector uh, through the banking system, loans are not being made as much to the private sector, and the government is is basically they're not just the lender of last resort; they're really the borrower of last resort. And so, yeah. this is what's happening over time. And what what I believe is that the government is not a a productive asset. You know, we're this is another part of the um, the misallocation of capital that's going on. What we're doing is we keep on funneling money through this system into the government and right now no, nobody's thinking about part of part of the part of what got us into this mess is the um the myth that that the government can't default or the government is uh low risk or zero risk and what's happening you know the irony of this is that the longer we go on the end game of this is that the government is is going to default. Um, the government is, you know, we've got $31 trillion in debt, um, not counting all the unfunded liabilities. And you've got, um, you know, Biden just proposed, I, I believe, a $6 trillion budget. So these people don't realize that uh, we've reached an inflection point with the everything bubble. We're two years past that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think, 
I think bubbles, this is, you and I agree on this. This is, uh, this is the greatest bubble known to mankind, and yep. it's not over yet. You know, it's in the process of unwinding. I also mm -hmm. believe that bubbles mark major inflection points. And so if we look at, at bubbles, bubbles always have a false belief. And I believe that this bubble, the false belief, is uh, uh, government uh, as universal pro problem solver. I, I believe that's that's what is driving this. And so... You know, where this all leads is I think we've seen a peak in the centralization of government. It's a 234 year trend in the United States. And I think the everything bubble marks the end of that trend. Um, and we're and now we're in the extremely early stages of all this, of course. So so people are not recognizing, you know, they're they're in we're in the denial stage. They don't see that a change has happened. The politicians will be the last ones to get the memo that, that things have changed. And they're all behaving as if as if it's business as usual. And and I don't think it is. I think it we're going into a, a very different period where um where where this stuff is coming to an end. And uh the government is is going to have to make some choices. You know, they're gonna have to live with constraints. And you know, I think as for as investors, we we have to be aware of this. Try to, you know, Try to navigate through this, what should be ultimately a really good thing. Ultimately, yeah. Um, between now and and ultimately is a lot of pain. So you you you, you got at, you, you started getting at a really good point though, um, and and I would say it this way: the the Federal Reserve and even the government itself, they start out as this kind of utility function. You know, they're in the background, they're an umpire, they do a few important things and, 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 you know, they're not supposed to do a whole lot else, but the fact that it's centralized makes it too attractive and it becomes, and it gets abused and it takes over. And as you say, it's not just the lender of last resort, it becomes the borrower of last resort. And instead of being the umpire, the umpire takes over the game. And this is Jim Grant from Grant's Interest Rate Observer, right? He says, this is ridiculous. We, we have, with the Federal Reserve, we, it's like having the umpire of the baseball game on the cover of the sports magazine instead of the big star who's you know, got all this great skill at playing baseball, right? So, um, so that is what has happened, and I, I agree. It's, at some point, it comes to a crisis where everybody realizes, ooh, this can be broken. It, it is breakable. This lender of last resort is not unbreakable. And, it, and it, the centralization of it, the, the simple existence of it as a central power is a magnet. It's a magnet for everything that would otherwise fail, like government itself. It just attracts all the power hungry and all the, all the schemes that would never make it in a free market. And eventually, and so therefore, sowing the seeds, its centralization sows the seeds of its undoing, proving that that is the main problem with it. Yeah, absolutely. The, and I think this is this is the whole point: is that um, and, you know this is a maybe a controversial thing to say, but but I do believe that uh, replacing the Articles of Confederation with the the Constitution kind of uh, set this country on the path towards centralization. And there are many steps along the way. Uh, Civil War, uh, Federal Reserve Act, you know, on and on and on. But you know, and that trend went on for 232 years, and I think it hit a hit a wall two years ago. Um, so, you know, we're now in the process of, and we've got we've got decentralization going on as well. You know, you see it with uh, with the internet. You you know, you see that you see it with uh, remote work. You know, we're working. We're doing this interview remotely right now. Um, so you've got all of these forces of decentralization that are, uh, you know, that are, are really invigorated right now and maybe even got a boost through through COVID. And you've so you've got that on one side, you know, those forces that are just building and building and building. And then you've got this this uh, this long trend of centralization that is basically running on on fumes. And I think the people that are 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 in that camp that you know they're ex it's the extrapolation game right it, it's that you know you've and i think there's a 
there's a, a chapter in uh, Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Taleb. He calls it Survival of the Least Fit. And it's all about, it's a evolution that, that what happens when you have these long benign periods is that the, the creatures that survive and thrive during that period, they become more and more specialized and um, they become more fragile to the new environment. And so I think this is kind of where we're at. We've got a lot of these, you know, these creatures out there, whether they're they're bankers or whether they're politicians or venture capitalists or you know academics or whatever. Um, you know, they're all creatures of this very benign environment. Whether you want to describe an environment of 232 years or maybe the last 10 or 15 years with zero interest rate policy, you know, but but. What's happened right now is we have a change. We have the sea change that's taking place. It's very early. And so those people are, of course, they don't want this to change. They don't want the, they love the old environment. Okay. They're not prepared for the new environment. And so they're telling us, hey, don't worry. <laughs> We've got it. Hey, the banking system is sound. Everything's under control. Don't worry about it. And Warren Buffett, you know, don't I, bet against America, right? Exactly. And, and, you know, this is a great time. I think, uh, you know, I think it's, first of all, it's a great time to be a contrarian, you know, watch this all play Mm -hmm. out. So there is a, uh, a chapter in Nassim Taleb's book, Fooled by Randomness, and it's Mm -hmm. called Survival of the Least Fit. And it describes evolution where you have uh, a benign environment and the, uh, the creatures that, um, that survive and thrive in that environment, uh, you know, they become, they, they uh, evolve and they become more and more specialized. And, and you can think about uh, the Galapagos Islands and the finches growing beaks that, you know, allow them to, to dig deeper into the, uh, into branches and, and look for, you know, ants or whatever. Um, the problem is that, that when the environment changes, especially when it becomes a hostile environment, that these animals, these creatures are uh, very fragile to this new environment, to the, the changing environment. Okay. And I think this is, this really describes what is happening today is that we've got all these, these kind of creatures that uh, are, have thrived in a, this very benign environment, um, you know, whether it be ZERP of the last 15 years since the, the 2008 crisis or whether it be uh, you know the, the last uh, 232 years with the centralization of power. And these people, uh, you know, I believe that we're at this sea change and they're living in the past. You know, they don't want this. They love the, the, the benign environment. And so, you know, you could think about it in terms of maybe your, your financial advisor. Uh, is he a creature of the past? And the problem is that, that these people will be the least prepared for the new environment. They're going to be, you know, and, and so these are the people right now that are saying, don't worry, the system is sound. Uh, you know, don't worry, we've got under, you know, we've got things under control. You know, right. th- these are the same people that have been running things. And, you know, the problem is, you know, they're going to, they're going to be running things right into the, into the ground and making things, things worse. This, Kevin, reminds me of a blog post by Mark Andreessen, the billionaire and entrepreneur and venture capital guy, actually. And on this blog post, he was saying, uh, what, what I took from it was all the stuff that the government is heavily regulating and heavily involved in, um, like education and health care, he named those. He says, the price just keeps going up and up and up. And healthcare is a real mystery because it's it's so technology driven, and the price keeps going up and up and up. And yet, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like TVs and computers and all this other technology driven stuff. The price just keeps going down and down and down. And and he says this is the this is the dividing line. And I feel like you're describing that. You're describing like all of this stuff that the centralized power takes over. The price goes up and up and up, and you know nobody. That's not good for anybody. It's not even good for them in the end, and and then it fails. But the rest of this stuff, like 
you know, I have a more powerful computer in my pocket than, you know, stuff that used to fill rooms decades ago. Um, because, and the pr- so effectively the price has gone down and down and down. Um, markets yeah. work, I guess, is the lesson, right? Yeah, mar- markets work. And, you know, you, I just think you have these two forces that are, are taking place right now. And yeah, it's epic. You know, what, what's, what's happening is, you're, you know, you are corrupting. Uh, these institutions and destroying them, and but at the same time, and you know, this is it's like the 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 you know the forest fire fire analogy, where uh, you know everything you have this old forest and and it burns, uh, but uh, at the same time, so that's you know that's of course the the the, uh, uh, the downside, but the upside is that you have all the green shoots, and you you know it brings about this you know it clears out the dead wood and it creates all the sunlight and the nutrients and, and everything for this, you know, this, uh, this new growth to take place. And so, you know, I think we have to balance what's going on. And it's just, just reality. You know, this is, this is the world that we live in. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you try to get as far away from these institutions that are, are failing and try to gravitate towards the positive things that are going on. And I think this is what's very exciting is that you have these two epic forces, you know, one is dying and another is just getting stronger and stronger, this force of, of decentralization and all the things that you talked about where prices are coming down. You know, you look at what's going on with genomic sequencing. And I was reading about, um, mm-hmm. I forget the name of the company, but uh, you know, the price is coming down uh, to like a couple hundred dollars to sequence the, the human genome. And, you know, all babies born are, are going to now be, be, be sequenced, you know, and the price, if we go back to 2000, I think the first time they did it, it cost something like a billion dollars, you know, that yeah. that's deflation. That's what, so, and it's, it's kind of interesting how you, you look at the, uh, uh, technology driven deflation that's taking place on the one in the one camp. And then you have this, this other side that's basically trying to inflate everything, you know, and they're trying to say that there's something wrong with deflation. Well, there's nothing wrong with a natural deflation. Even a, even a, uh, a, a you know, a, a bubble bursting type of deflation is, is a good thing, in, in my mm-hmm. opinion. So, yeah, these people are, are absolutely, you know, so, the, so what we're seeing is two entirely different worlds right now, these forces that are, in, you know, in an epic battle. And, you know, what I see is just the old is dying and the new is, is taking over. And this is going to provide this incredible renaissance. But as you said, the transition period is going to be uh, painful. It's going to be bumpy for those people that are living in the past uh, and unprepared. It's going to be especially painful. And I think if you see, if you understand what's taking place, you can, you can try to protect yourself. All right. Um, I actually think this is a perfect moment to, address my final question because that was a beautiful summation right there the final question same for you've answered it twice before it's the same for every guest no matter what the topic and that is if you could leave our listener with a single thought today whether it's financial or economic or just general wisdom whatever you like and even if you've already said it feel free to repeat it if you could leave them with one thought today what would it be okay sure um I think we're at a major inflection point. I think we're very early. Uh, And so, and it's going to be bumpy. Uh, So the first thing, my advice to people always is grab the oxygen mask, you know, take care of yourself. You're not going to be able to help anybody else unless you do that. Um, The second thing is, you know, kind of step back and, and look at this, you know, maybe, maybe as a good citizen or, or, you know, somebody who wants to, really understand, you know, the root of the problem and, and, and change this, you know, understand that we can change the system. We only need about 10% of, you know, really passionate people. If they understood fractional reserve banking and central banking and understood uh, the, the problems with this, the in, inherent design flaw of this system, uh, I think we could end this, you know, by next Tuesday. And so, you know, my, my advice would simply be, Get up the learning curve, and um, I would I would recommend people go to uh, Mises.org, the the Mises Institute's website. They're very good on central banking and uh, um, and fractional reserve banking, and um, and also uh, you know read Murray Rothbard. He's the 
He's the foremost, was the foremost critic of central banking. Uh, there's a couple of good books that I could recommend. What has government done to our money, which he wrote in 1963. And then uh, before he passed away in 1965, he wrote uh, the case, the case against the Fed, which really, mm -hmm. really describes this idea of, of warehousing and, and loan banking and, and how it all works. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for that. And thanks for coming back and talking with us. Thanks. Thanks for having me back on. It's, yeah, it's going to get it's going to get more interesting. I could guarantee that. <laughs> Many mainstream analysts are predicting that stocks will recover soon, but I say we'll instead witness a cash frenzy, unlike we've experienced in 21 years before stocks recover. And I'm urging Americans not to buy a single stock until they see it. I predicted the Lehman Brothers crash in 2008, and I called the top of the NASDAQ in 2021. But this, this is the number one most important thing to pay attention to for 2023. And I'm not talking about another market crash or politics or inflation or any of these other things. As all this unfolds, the financial consequences of what I'm talking about could last for several decades if you don't understand what's happening. There will be winners and losers. And now is the time to decide which one you'll be. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about my warning totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.stockdeadzone.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to get my four steps to prepare for what's coming. Again, that's www.stockdeadzone for a free copy of this new report. I'm really glad that we had Kevin Duffy on because he's got his own particular way of seeing the world. And it's from obviously from a very um, deep belief in the power of free markets, um, which I also have. So I, I agree with a lot of what he said, most of it, I would say. And so we got to hear, you know, his take on really the underlying cause of the Silicon Valley and, you know, and Signature Bank and Silvergate and all the rest of it, uh, of these bank failures which I, I couldn't disagree. I can't disagree that it's the essence of the fractional reserve system. You know, Silicon Valley Bank had this $42 billion run on deposits in one week, and then they had to shut it down. Um, this can happen to any bank in the country. People don't realize this. No bank can withstand a run on deposits. The safest bank in the country can't withstand a run on deposits. I mean, you heard Kevin talking about, they're all leveraged. Like a, 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 a more conservative bank is only levered 10 times. <laughs> you know? So it's crazy um, the way this system works. It's a pure confidence game and people lose confidence. They take their money out, the bank fails. It's just like that. And it can happen to the whole system. And we're kind of lucky that it hasn't happened so far. Um, great stuff. I love the way Kevin thinks. And um, I follow him on Twitter. He's a very wise fellow. Um, and a good investor, too. Great to talk with him. So, all right. Well, that's another interview, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com. Click on the episode you want. Scroll all the way down. Click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com, please. And also, do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call our listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. 
This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.